hello and welcome to my channel Christina's cleaning and homemaking in today's video I am going to make a dress for my daughter for her birthday my husband's out doing yard work and I have my little girl with me and she's playing so I decided now would be a good time to do it she's a 4th of July baby so she's a firecracker yeah. baby so my husband and I went through my patterns and we decided on this one here by simplicity number 8614 and I'm going to make it, but I'm not going to make it just out of one fabric. I picked out four different fabrics here, and this one for the stars, this one with the flag and musical notes, this one, a blue sky filled with fireworks, and this red, white, and blue striped one. Now the plan is, and sometimes plans change, the top bodice part will be done with this fabric. Then I plan for the skirt to be with this fabric. And there is a bow on it that I plan to have this fabric in. And I'm looking at the skirt and I got a half yard of each fabric. So in case there's not enough fabric with the skirt fabric that I picked out to make the full dress, I plan on using this as the back side of the skirt. So it'd be one color on the front, another color on the back, It'll be, this is the top part, and then there's the bow, which I plan to have in the stars. So I think this could turn out to be a really cute dress. It's the first time I've sewn this pattern, so I'll take you step by step with me on what I do, and you'll get to see how it turns out. Okay, so the first thing I have to do is clear off my little studio here, because this is where I also photograph and post on Etsy the rosaries that I make. And so it doubles as like my computer desk, my rosary station, and also it's where I cut the fabric and sew. So I've got to clear this off and then I will start laying out the pattern. As you can see here, all the pattern pieces are cut out. So I'm going to start laying out the fabric soon for the bodice, which the bodice pieces are the two pieces that you can see on the right here. Um, in fact, one's all the way to the right and then the one's the piece a little bit further back and those are the two pieces I will use for the bodice so I'm just going to lay out the fabric for the bodice and then I'm going to work on laying out the pieces. Yeah, create a little bit of a breeze laying down the fabric and had some of the pieces sort of float off to the other side because they're made with a really light pattern tissue. But um, yeah, I'm just folding out the fabric here, laying it out and then I'll fold the flap over and it's a little bit of trial and error working this out because initially I usually lay it out, I'll lay down the pattern pieces, see how they best fit and then like in this case I realized that I had a, a decent chunk of fabric left over that would be just wasted scrap by the way I had pieces laid out. So after I laid them out the first time it occurred to me that it'd probably be a good idea to go ahead and just move the pieces closer to the edge and then bring the fold in further so that way I wouldn't waste as much fabric but initially I was just sort of folding it, laying it out and putting the pieces down in order to get it going but once I stepped back to review I realized that I was going to be wasting more fabric than was really necessary and so it'd be better to just sort of refold the fabric in order to um, Make the pieces fit better, if you will. Now I thought I had the fabric all perfectly laid out and had it pinned and was ready to cut it as you see here with me inserting the last 
depends on the back part of the bodice, when it occurred to me that while the pieces may fit ever so perfectly on the fabric, there was a slight problem. That being that the front bodice fabric would look upside down in fabric compared to the back since all the American flags were one side up and not like rotated around. So I unpinned it and I flipped it back right side, which fits still perfectly on the fabric, but that way it made sure that the American flags would be upright and the musical notes would be going the right direction as well for the front part of this dress. So here's a view for you of the two bodice pieces laid out on the fabric and this is another angle to show you what they look like laid out and pinned out before cutting them. So the um, what's actually the front part of the bodice is the piece that's furthest from the, um, from the camera here. And you'll actually see me going around and tracing out the pieces onto the fabric. I use a regular pen because I find that it will wash off and even if it doesn't it's on part that's going to be hidden because I use a 5 8 inch of a seam and so these are all the outer edges but I go around tracing all the pieces first and then usually I'll go back and cut them out especially if I use a pattern that has different sizes I don't want to cut it at you know a small and then not be able to make it in a large later and this one I was making actually in a size large but sometimes the lines will cross each other and I didn't want to lose those pattern pieces if I wanted to make a smaller size sometimes later. So now that I have those pieces traced onto the fabric, I am going to start cutting them out and making sure to cut where the notches are and any markings on the pattern. And there you see me lining it back up to make sure I got the notches lined up correctly. And anytime I miss a notch, I try to go back and mark it on the fabric to make sure I don't lose the spots where things need to line up. Now that I'm done with the two front pieces, I'm laying out the fabric and moving on to the next piece, which as you'll see, it only requires one cut and it has no folds to it. Initially, I was lining it up on the edge, and then when I looked at the pattern, I realized it's for bias, and so it needs to be on an angle and stretch, so I made sure to have the pattern piece lined up with the fabric in the direction the arrow was going, so that way it was giving me the um, binding for the top front of the dress, which 
because it'll be going around a curve, needs to have a little bit more stress to it. So basically, I'm using the pattern of the fabric itself to make the bias tape for the collar as opposed to using a store-bought bias tape that's sort of just a solid color pre-made. So this will actually coordinate with the dress itself because the bias tape is coming out of the fabric for the dress. Now before putting the pattern piece aside, I'm marking the little dots on the pattern or on the piece of fabric to make sure I have it over from the pattern so that when I go to line it up on the dress, I'll have the markings set and know where I need to place the bias tape on the next piece that it attaches to. Now on to the front part of the skirt. So I'm putting up the fabric in the previous pieces, the, um, the bodices, and I'm moving on to getting the skirt piece. And I want to make sure I had the right pattern piece for that and then to lay out the fabric for the skirt. And I had decided on having the, um, the bottom front be um, this fabric, the one with the fireworks on it. Now, I did try in placing the pattern piece to see if I could possibly squeeze out both the front and the back um, skirt made out of this fabric, and as you can see when I waved the fabric, once again the pattern pieces went flying off the other side because they're so light. So I was folding it in half and trying to see if I might be able to squeeze both pieces, which if I'd been making a smaller size, it might have worked, but since I was making the size large, it wasn't going to quite fit on the fabric that I had um, bought. I'm not even sure, to be honest with you, if I'd gotten like three-fourths of a yard, if that would have fit either, because in laying it out, um, flapping over the other side, it, it just wasn't quite enough fabric. But you see here, I mean, laying this piece out and getting it all lined up, and then um, getting ready to cut it, and, is sort of moving on with the idea that I was going to have a different front and different back to the skirt, which I got to say, you'll see at the end, did end up looking really nice after all. And you can see in a moment here my moment of self-doubt where I took a scrap piece from the top fabric and lined it up over the fabric that I was using for the skirt front and back to try and get an idea of what the dress was going to look like with the one fabric on top and then having the other fabrics on the back and front for the skirt. There was a moment where I did contemplate possibly switching out what would be the fabric for the bow on the back of the dress. But I decided in the end that having the striped fabric was going to work best and it did coordinate well enough with the fireworks fabric for that to be the back and the fireworks fabric to be the front of the skirt. <laughs> 
Now moving on to laying out the fabric for and laying out the pattern to cut out the back portion of the skirt. When I was laying out the fabric, I noticed that one end seemed to almost gather towards the selvage and I couldn't understand why. So I flipped it around because it seemed like the other side didn't really quite do that. And I didn't want to have to fight with the fabric to get to straighten out. So that's why I turned the fabric around there. I've never had fabric that wasn't a cotton knit. Even cotton knits typically don't do that. So I'm not sure why this particular fabric did it, the others didn't. But I turned it around to the other side where the selvage wasn't sort of doing an unnatural gathering and then laying the fabric out in order to cut the pieces. Um, if you'll notice that there's no like lay the fabric or lay the pattern on the fabric on the fold on this piece because it's the back piece. So I um, just sort of pinned it with a little bit of excess fabric on either side since it was the kind of fabric where you're going to cut two pieces anyway. But um, yeah, this is just laying it out. Now that I got the fabric all smoothed out and the pattern smoothed out, pinning it down. And then um, on some pieces, I will trace around with the pen. And other pieces, if it's a matter of I'm just cutting straight on the tissue and it really doesn't matter, I'll you know, go ahead and cut with the scissors if it's not going to affect the sizing on um, other sizes for the pattern pieces. And this is always the tricky part, cutting around the tabs that I use to mark like where to attach to the, um, the bodice of the dress and then you know on the sides trying to turn the scissors quite right in order to make sure to cut that perfectly. Um, I, I've cut these types of pieces before with my rotary cutter, um, the, the rolling one that I think you'll see on another piece that I end up cutting for this particular pattern but um, it's, it's kind of hard to make those point angles too, so sometimes I'll stop using that and use the scissors instead when making dresses or other items. So now I'm just folding a lot of the pieces that I've already used up to put back into the package. I try and fold them on the lines that they had from when they originally came out of the, um, the pattern um, envelope because I like keeping them as neat as possible, so I try to stay keeping them folded on their original fold lines that they were in when they were in the whole long piece of um, the pattern tissue. So every once in a while I'll start folding one, have to unfold it a little bit because I realize I don't have it folded quite right and it's not going flat, but it just makes it easier to get all the pieces back into the envelope when the pieces are folded roughly the same way they were when they came out of the envelope to begin with. So now onto laying out the fabric to do the ribbon on the back. It consists pretty much of two pieces. The one main pattern piece that will make the ribbon itself and then the center piece which I will wrap around the ribbon piece in order to make the bow for it. It's an interesting way to make a, a bow really. I've not done this type before. So um, here I'm just sort of laying it out because unlike the bias tape piece I don't have to lay it at an angle, I can just lay it straight on the fabric and you can see a little bit of the excess um, pattern paper going off the side. That's um, past where the line of the pattern is. Normally before cutting I'll have trimmed that piece off but this time I didn't. I just figured I'd go ahead and trim it as I go along with cutting the um, this particular piece out of the fabric. So I just sort of left it in there. I believe this might actually be the piece, yep, that I, I pulled out the rotary cutter. Um, sometimes it's decently easy to cut with a scissor, but this time it was just easier to pull out the rotary cutter and use the pad underneath and just run the rotary cutter down the edge. It just it made it quicker and, and easier and a little bit more precise, particularly since I didn't have to draw anything with the pen onto the fabric and I could just run the cutter straight down the fabric and the board.
Now in this little corner, I can lay out the square piece to make the center of the bow. That's the piece that will actually make the ribbon into the bow itself and hold it down in the middle. So this is that little piece, so I'm just pinning that down. And that's a real easy piece to just sort of pin down and cut out and be done with it. Just so I don't have to worry about it later, I also got out the pattern piece for the um, eyelet lace trim, and I laid out the trim with that. And instead of trying to really fold it over completely with the pattern piece, basically I just laid it out and then, you know, looked to see where the edge was and went ahead and cut it. And that ended up being a, a lot easier because the 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 lace eyelet wanted to really curve a lot when I was doing that, and then I just when and put the pattern piece up because it's really easy to lose those pieces if I don't put them away fairly quickly once I'm done and there weren't any markings that I had to transfer so I didn't need to worry about that part either. Now the other piece that I need to cut out was for around the bottom of the skirt, which it interestingly enough wanted me to cut out two pieces and then sew them together, I guess because of the seam allowance. So I was trying to line that up perfectly with the pattern piece and then just go ahead and cut that and then cut the second piece based off of what I did with the first piece rather than fight with the pattern both times. But um, it, was, it was better I think to do that from the start so I had the pieces all ready and waiting and based off the length that I could distinguish them from the other piece which went around the collar. Now according to the pattern instructions, the first steps were to do stay stitching at the collar on the neck of both pieces in order to make sure that the fabric didn't like fray or stretch too much. It just sort of kept it as it should be, um, as originally was, in order to attach the pieces that are so they stayed sturdier and didn't need anything like interfacing because there's only the front and the back, no yoke. So now that the pieces are cut out and we've looked over the instructions, I'm just going to go ahead and sew in the stay stitching on the pieces. This is the front piece I believe I'm sewing around the neck on that and then I'll move on to the other two pieces to sew the stay stitching on that. Now this is the stay stitching for the two back pieces, so I had to get around the um, collars on them as well. And there was another part, I believe it was um, the, the armhole where it wanted me to also do the stay stitching on these two pieces. Once done with the stay stitching, I line up the shoulder pieces for the front bodice to the two back bodice pieces, and I'm sewing those as you can see there. And I want to make sure I stay at the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. So if I see it kind of go off with that a little bit, especially if it goes too short, I'll go back and stitch over it again to make sure it's at the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. And periodically, the thread will undo from my needle. So, like you can see there, I had to re thread the needle so I could do the second shoulder piece because it had come out. 
fold over the two end pieces for the lace trim for the top and stitch those down. It's a really, really fine fold over there, fine seam on that. So I just folded that over um, really thin, pinned that down enough to hold it. That way I could run it under and sew those ends down before I gather them because I'll attach those to the neckline and then that'll be the um, last step I believe for the bodice at this point. Now to gather the eyelet lace, basically you put your machine on a basting stitch, so I usually set mine on my Anovis to an 8, which is a longer basting stitch, and then I try and shorten the length of the stitch on the machine, and then I just run it through, and I try to make sure that to begin with I have enough bobbin thread out, as well as needle thread, so that way when I go back later, because the fabric's naturally going to pull on the thread as it gathers, and it gives me enough excess that once I have it all run through the machine, I can still grab that bobbin thread and gather it. So it's usually two run-throughs. You, you run the lace eyelet through one time and that puts the initial bit in there and you'll notice that's starting to gather at that point already and then you run it through a second time and it's those two stitches working together and the bobbin thread that allows you to pull on the bobbin thread and then do the gatherings on the, um, the lace trim for the dress. And this is what it looks like with the lace trim pinned to the bodice of the dress. So now it's time to actually sew the lace trim onto the dress. And it's basically just carefully feeding it through because one, got to take the pins out, and two, I'm going around curves while trying to make sure I keep the gathers in on this lace. So it's sewing the, the lace to the top bodice while working with gathers. So you work a little bit more slowly with this and have to stop periodically.
Now back over to the cutting table where I'm going to fold up the edge of the bias tape because this trim is now going to be what separates the two sections of the dress, if you will, at the bodice. So there'll be the lower bodice and then there'll be the lace and then there'll be this bias tape trim that um, covers over the top neckline area and sort of, it kind of pops a little bit. So having the same fabric against the lace and then on either side, it, it kind of pops out for the dress, which is really rather beautiful. And um, so that's why it's cut at an angle. So that way it'll stretch with the neckline because the neckline's curved. So this is just folding that down, trying to find the dot markings that I put on the bias tape earlier, and then attaching that to the dress. That's why I got in the way of the camera a bit there. Otherwise you'd be able to see this better. But right at that point, I'm making sure I have folded the correct edge of the um, bias tape and I'm looking for the dots to make sure I can line up the dots with the um, with the markers on the, the bodice that way I can attach this to the correct spots. Now that I got it all attached to the bodice, I'm going to head over to the machine and sew it down. And the interesting part of doing the bias tape is that once I get this part stitched down, I have to then fold it over, tuck it under, and um, stitch it again in order to have it folded over and attached. But at this point, I'm just now attaching it over the top bodice part so you can kind of see the fabric curling over but that's where it was folded so that way when I would do the stitching um, I'd be able to fold it under and gather it so that it would cover over the top and, and create the bias neckline. Okay, now that that's all stitched down, it's back over to the cutting table, and this is where you could see me folding over the fabric and then pinning it down in order to um, create the seam there. And it's supposed to be sewn in such a way that you really don't see the thread too much on the other side, but it just sort of seals it down. The instructions for the pattern actually talk about how to fold it and make it so that you're, where the placement is for sewing this down on the inside puts the seam sort of in like a, a gutter if you will. It'll be 
below more into the lace than it will be onto the fabric on the front. So it's being sewn from behind, but it's being hidden at the same time. So it creates a sort of, well, seamless look, if you will, when you look at the front of the dress versus the back of the dress, but the stitches are there and set to hold the bias tape in perfectly. Now back over to the machine to do the stitching that I was telling you about with sealing the bias tape down in such a way that I think the way I managed to do it actually was to fold everything over from the back but pin it from the front because I have tried on other items that I've made to sew from the back and then keep looking at the front and I'd see where the stitches went off and weren't staying where they were supposed to. So it's a little bit complicated but I try to fold over just a little bit more on the back and fold it down and then check with the front so that way I make sure that when I pin it and I run it through the machine that the stitches are going to stay just off the edge but still sew the bias tape down in the back so that the seam doesn't show and it's hidden per the instructions. And with the lace sewn on there, now it's time to sew the sides of the bodices together. So it'll be the top shoulder parts, the lace, then the bias tape um, for the trim, and now the sides of the bodice are being sewn together. The next step is to put bias tape on the armhole since there won't be sleeves on this. So initially I was going to start out with the red bias tape that I had on hand, but then I realized that that was a double fold and I needed a single fold. So it turned out that in my sewing drawer I actually had white single fold bias tape from a previous project. So I pulled that out and I put that on there instead of the red one. So here you see me as I was working with the red bias tape, realizing that it was a double fold instead of a single fold, so it wasn't going to work for this project. Now this is the single fold bias tape that I had in my drawer, so it's just a nice white bias tape 
so it'll blend in with the fabric and not be too flashy. The red coordinated well enough because of the flags in the design, but the white bias tape really does work better as far as color goes and blending in and not making a big contrast on the armholes. So I'm just pinning that and then once I get that all pinned around, then I'll sew that on, but right now it's just the, the pinning it to, overlapping it, and then clipping it so I can get ready to go over to the sewing machine and sew the bias tape on it. Seal, create basically the, the seal off the, um, the fold for the armholes. Now it's time to sew the binding on, which let me say, on armholes, that's kind of difficult because it's a very tight spot. So I'm constantly having to readjust and figure out, well, do I want to take it from the inside or the outside? So I usually try and make sure that when I put the pins in, that I have them going in the direction that I can just pull and get them out. Um, as you can see in this case, I was actually rotating the wheel to get the sewing started because it's such a tight spot that I wanted to get the thread started before I even pushed down on the pedal because I wanted to be able to remove a pin shortly after I pushed down on the pedal, but couldn't get that going until after I'd at least gotten a few stitches in so that way it would hold together once the pin was out. And then I'm just very slowly sewing, rotating it around, and removing pins in order to make sure that it nothing bunches or overlaps and that just sort of sews flat and correctly while moving around in a very tight spot. Now on to the next armhole and pretty much repeating the same process there that I did on the previous one. So line it up, pin it down, and then um, I'm going to try and make sure on this one just like I did on the previous one, but you may not have seen it, where I try, if I can, to overlap the, um, the, the fabric, the bias tape there in order to make sure that there's no um, exposed ends because I don't want anything to fray so typically after I pin it around I'll um, try and clip enough extra that I can overlap the ends and have them sew down together if not it's usually not too big a deal with bias tape but it just looks better if I can overlap the ends of those 
and back to the sewing machine to start sewing this side of the armhole down and get the bias tape sewn onto it. Now this time I put the pins in the opposite direction so I'm starting over on the right side and sewing counterclockwise as opposed to last time where I was sewing clockwise. Um, it's usually a matter of which way is going to be the easiest to direct the fabric on the sewing machine and so I usually try and keep most of the fabric to the left but um, this time it just seemed easier if I started on the right and went counterclockwise with the fabric in order to sew this armhole down and frankly also it can be a pain if I put the pins in one direction and get to the machine and realize that I have to undo each pin and pin the item in the opposite direction to make sure sewing will go more smoothly so I usually try and think out beforehand of what's the easiest way to run the fabric under the machine going which direction and then I'll pin accordingly. Now it's time to clip the bias tape. So I pretty much clip from the edge up to the stitches and that'll make it easier to fold that, um, the bias tape over the edge and to sew it down to basically to seal the armhole and make it a complete um, closed armhole there. So I'm going around and I'm just making little cuts going as far as the stitch line so that way the fabric can open up and it won't sort of make a, a hard curve but it'll be much more flexible and it'll be easier to fold the, the bias tape over on the fabric and it won't like make creases. So um, this is a really good method for any time you're sewing something that has like a, um, well, a circle type shape or even a half circle, but any curve really. If you um, clip on the curve, it just, it'll make it easier to fold fabric over and to sew or to turn it if you have to, for instance, turn it from inside out to right side out. So I was just going through and clipping the curves and then after that I'll fold the bias tape over so the, um, the folded in will cover the stitched end where I just clipped and it'll complete the armhole but you'll see that in a moment when I go to um, fold it over and sew it. Something that I think I didn't think to mention before is that the um, open part of the bias tape I sewed it right sides together to um, the fabric. So the right side of the bias tape is sewn down to the right side of the bodice fabric and then after it's sewn it's clipped and so now I'm turning the bias tape to the inside and I'm going to be sewing it down on the inside. So you won't see the bias tape on the outside anymore except for maybe from the very edge. And I'm going to speed it up for you a little bit here because otherwise just watching it takes a little bit longer than it you know, otherwise should, but you get the general idea of tucking it over, folding it, pinning it, and getting it ready for the machine. Now back over to the machine to sew the bias tape that I just pinned down and once again I'm going to go slowly and carefully to make sure that everything sews down right and I've sped up the video for you a little bit just so that way it won't take as long as what it actually did when I was doing it. To explain what you see right here as I was sewing a little bit of lace got caught in between the, um, the needle and the thread so 
it got stitched down to the bodice. So I had to stop, cut the thread, take my seam ripper out, and I'm just taking out those three stitches where it caught the lace. And then I'll put that back and put it back under the machine in order to continue sewing it down. But that's something that sometimes happens. As I was sewing it, it occurred to me that the lace might be slipping underneath, and sure enough it did, so I just had to take a few stitches out so I could go back and fix that. Now that I've got those pieces done, I'm going back over to the cutting table and I'm unpinning these skirt pieces and making sure I have already transferred any marks that I need to over to the actual um, fabric piece there and just folding up and putting away the pattern. So um, next step is on to the two skirt pieces and basically just pinning them together and sewing that and then we'll move on from there. Now as I go to line up the skirt back to the skirt front, you'll see one of the beautiful reasons for having the notches on the patterns that you transfer on to these um, fabric pieces is because when I first laid down the back pieces for the skirt, I was having a little trouble getting it to line up and at first I couldn't figure out why and then I realized that while both sides of each skirt piece had notches on it, the, um, the part that went to the back skirt fabric piece had the notch higher up. So initially I had them laying down on the wrong side and when the notches didn't line up, that's what clued me in. So I was able to switch the two pieces and make sure they lined up properly and all the notches were lined up. So then I was able to pin it correctly so that way I could sew it together because everything was lining up as it should. Now it's time to go back over to the machine and once again I sped up the video just so it doesn't take as long with watching it but I'm sewing the front panel to the back panel, beating the fabric through slowly and then removing the pins as I go along because I don't sew over pins, you can break a machine doing that. So I'm just doing a um, stitch down that 5 8 7 inch seam allowance and then um, taking out the pins as I go and I'm going to do that on both sides of the um, skirt panel to sew them together at the side. Now that both sides have been sewn together, I need to 
pin up the middle of the back to the notch that allows for the opening for the zipper section. So I'm just putting those two parts of the, um, the back of the skirt together and then once I've got the, everything lined up, I'm going to pin it up to the notch to make sure I don't sew past the notch and then after that I'll take it back over the machine and sew that. Now it's time to sew where I pin, again, 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. Start out with a little bit of forward stitch followed up by a back stitch to make the seam stay strong. And I'm just going to sew, taking out each pin, but up to the notch. And then at the notch I'll stop and I'll back up the stitch a little bit there in order to make sure it's secure and tight and it's not going to come out or pull apart. And then take out the rest of the pins because the next step is going to be sewing around the waist with a basting stitch in order to do the gathering, so you'll see that here in a minute. The next step in the pattern instructions was to sew the two pieces of eyelet lace that's going to trim the bottom of the skirt together at the ends, so that way um, they'd be sewn and then I would sew that to the bottom of the skirt. So Right now, according to the instructions, I'm just supposed to sew the eyelet lace together on the sides, so that way the eyelet lace will have seams that match the side seams on the skirt, so that way I have to sew it together first, and then I'll pin it to the skirt and sew it to the skirt. So here I am over at the machine, same 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on the eyelet lace, so I'm just going to run either side through the machine, and then I'll head over to the skirt bottom. Now back over to the skirt to sew the lace onto the bottoms. I'm just trimming off any extra strings that came along with clipping the thread at the end of sewing the eyelet lace together. And so now I'm going to attach the lace to the bottom of the skirt. And in order to make the seam be on the inside, I've basically put the eyelet lace upside down, slid it over the bottom of the skirt so it's right side facing the right side of the skirt and then I'm pinning it together so the bottom part of the lace right now is facing towards the top part of the skirt because once I sew it down I'm going to flip the lace down and so in order to make it look right it has to go right side together but the lace is being sewn on upside down facing onto the skirt. Now it's time to sew the eyelet lace to the skirt bottom. So I went and selected the regular stitch on my machine and I'm just taking it through again. And I actually did a little bit less than a 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance on this because the top of the lace, um, if I would have done the 5 eighths of an inch, it would have really gone far into the, um, the lace. And for the instructions, I had pinned the lace to the edge of the skirt so I didn't want to lose that kind of length on the, the lace. So in this case, I probably did a little bit closer to um, a quarter of an inch or so, but um, not quite as wide as the 5 eighths of an inch allowance, but still a decent little bit of a seam allowance. 
now the next part of making the skirt is to adorn, if you will, the bottom of the skirt where um, the lace is just above the lace. I will be putting the same red rickrack that I put on the, um, the bodice. So I'm just going along around on the skirt here and pinning the rickrack, which this is baby rickrack. So it's very thin, so it's kind of complicated trying to get the one end to fold under. I'd um, finished the edge on the rickrack already so it won't fray, but I was still trying to fold it under so it wasn't just an exposed edge. And so I'm going to start pinning that around on the skirt. And typically when I do rickrack, I'll leave a little extra on the end when I sew in case I end up adjusting where the rickrack lies. I'm not going to fall short of rickrack towards the end, so I usually leave probably about a half inch or so of rickrack on the um, the closing edge when I've gone all the way around the, the skirt to make sure that there's a little bit excess in case I need it. you can see there, I'm not pinning the rickrack directly on the edge because according to the pattern instructions, a little bit of the um, bottom of the fabric before the lace is supposed to be exposed. So I have it just above, probably in, I'd say a quarter of an inch difference, maybe a little bit less to be honest with you. Just enough that you can see a, a strip, a line of the fabric between the lace and the rickrack trim. Now it's back over to the machine to stitch down the rickrack. I've switched the thread of the machine to a red thread to match the rickrack. So I'm just taking that through now and periodically removing pins. That's actually one of the complicated parts is because it's such small rickrack, having to adjust the rickrack's placement a lot. And because I didn't want the pin to get sucked into the machine, if you will, because I could break the machine. I'm slowly stitching down, adjusting the pin, stitching some more and going along, but starting off is probably the hardest part because of needing to remove the pin but at the same time not wanting it to move. And I, a tip for that I'd say is instead of starting at the very beginning of the rickrack, which I've done this a few times too, is to go to a section probably midway through where you see a decent bit of spacing between the pins and start sewing there so that way you can leave the, um, the overlap part towards middle end when you're sewing and you don't have to fuss with that um, beginning part and getting started so much which from the looks of it, I think I actually did that here where I started not so much at the very beginning but at the middle part but it's still kind of interesting trying to find a spot where the pins aren't quite as close together but the rickrack is still pretty well held in place in order to start stitching and making sure that stays in place. <laughs> 
So now I'm readjusting my machine for the basting stitch and the basting stitch's length. And I'm making sure to pull out a little extra of the um, bobbin thread because um, like when doing the gathering on the eyelet lace, it just makes it a little bit easier if you have longer bobbin thread already pulled out. And so I'm stitching closer to the edge on the first go and then um, with flattening out the seams on the, um, the, the skirt panels while I do the basting stitch and then after I'm done doing this first row I'll go back and do a second row that's closer to the 5 8 of an inch line the, um, the seam line and that's what I'll use to gather the skirt as you can probably tell in the video right now it's already starting to gather that is the beauty of having the basting stitches um, especially on the first run it'll start to pull together a little bit and then when I take it through on the second run since it's already starting to gather it'll gather even more and so I've already got part of the work done for me just by running it through the machine on the um, basting stitch to gather it and then after I get done stitching it I'll grab the bobbin thread and I'll pull on them and that'll gather the skirt edge for me so it'll be a gathered waist on the skirt. Now to the part that I told you would be coming up in a minute. So this is the part where I'm going to grab the bobbin threads from the basting stitches that I did around the waist and I'm going to pull on the bobbin stitches and tighten them so that way it gathers the waist and I find it's better to, if need be, over gather with the bobbin stitches so that way when you go to pin the waist to the bodice it's more gathered and you just have to spread it out versus not having it gathered enough and having to try and pull on the bobbin stitches to gather it when it's already pinned to the bodice. So I'm just pulling on either side, gathering the thread so that way the waist pulls and gathers and then it's going to tighten and you'll see the, um, the effects of the gathering and it'll make the waist really small and then I'll line it up with the bodice and I'll start pinning it to the bodice. Okay, so at this point I have most of the bodice pinned to the skirt and as you can see I'm working out the gathers while I'm pinning the skirt to the bodice. This is what I was talking about, about how it's easier to have it a lot gathered and then just smooth it out as you're pinning it to the bodice. And then the end parts are always the most difficult when you go over to the machine trying to make sure that the ends stay lined up because they're going to want to move because of the angles and because of the gathering. So I tend to pin a lot so that way when I get over to the machine it holds together and it's easier to sew that way. Now I'm just sewing the bodice to the skirt here and I'll be going slow and removing the pins and then just sticking in the pin cushion as I go along and smoothing the fabric out because I don't want there to be any creases um, and any irregularities in the gathers and fortunately that is the beauty of sewing to something that is gathered is that well it bunches together and so that's supposed to look that way as opposed to when you have to flatten out fabric if you're sewing a bodice to a flat straight skirt so in this case I only really have to worry about the bodice pieces bunching up and making sure they stay flat while I'm sewing it. 
Now that the bodice has been attached to the skirt, it's time to go ahead and put the rickrack trim at the top part on the bodice, right around the part where it connects to the um, skirt portion. So again, working with the baby rickrack, it's small and difficult, and going ahead and pinning that around the bodice. And then after I get it all pinned, I'll go back and I'll sew it on there. But right now, I'm just trying to work the baby rickrack on there and get it pinned to the bodice to begin with. Now over to the sewing machine to go ahead and sew the baby rickrack on. I switched the thread again back to the red thread so that it'll match the rickrack and the color will just blend. I don't actually like go back and forth with the zigzag shape of the rickrack. I just sew a straight line and usually it, by going right up the middle, will sew the rickrack down and you won't see any of the thread. And so it just sort of masks itself um, as you sew the rickrack on there. So the second to last part of working on this dress is to add the zipper. Now initially I tried a method that I've used before and has been successful in the past, which is basting the seam shut where the zipper will go, flattening it out, and then sewing the zipper on. But the problem with this particular design is that the sides are already sewn shut, so you can't really successfully do that sort of method with this one. So I had to tear out the basting stitches and then open up the zipper, pin it to the seam where the zipper is going, and then sew it in. So you can see here where 
I was trying to work on the zipper, which sometimes it takes a little bit of working with the fabric and the zipper and figuring out which side of the zipper foot to have the zipper on in order to get it sewn in best. So this is just going down the left side and then I'll turn the fabric to go along the bottom of the zipper to stitch, stitch the zipper in place and I'll go along the right side after that. But yeah, it always takes a little bit of extra work it seems on doing the zipper part because they're just a little bit more complicated. That's the part where I switch the zipper foot over to the other side in order to try and sew down the zipper to see if that, that method would work better because I was having a harder time getting the zipper foot to grip when I had it shifted over to the right. Now at this point I've gone across the zipper and I'm getting ready to sew back up on the right side so I'm going in the opposite direction and I actually did find this part to be just a little bit easier but it's just a matter of laying the fabric because I wanted the fabric to lay in such a way over the zipper that the teeth would be hidden so I had the fabric laying over the zipper, um, the actual teeth part and then I'm stitching down and I'm trying to get close to the teeth without sewing on them which is a little bit difficult because you're pretty much sewing blind and then when I got to the top where the eyelet lace is I had to make sure that it was laying down in such a way that it would get stitched over with the zipper otherwise it would look kind of odd being sort of fluffed up so I made sure that everything was tacked down there and then just taking the stitches slowly over turning the wheel towards the end there because that's about four layers of fabric it's going over. So this is the final product. The dress turned out fantastic and my daughter looked absolutely adorable on her birthday wearing it. Um, the back bow, I folded over the um, edges to make a hem on it. So it's about of a quarter of an inch of hem on all sides of it. And then I made the bow part by folding the fabric in half and going about four inches in to where the um, markers were to make um, I stitched across there and then folded that flat and that made the bow and then I attached this to the dress with plastic snaps. So the snap is going through the inner part of the bow and then the part that hangs down and it's, um, I use snap pliers to attach the opposing piece onto the dress. So the bow is attached to the dress with snaps. I thank you for watching my video. If you like it, please click like down below and I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. And 
tune in for more videos for selling.